So if everyone's nearly settled down, we might kick off our astronaut panel event as part of the Global Networking Forum here at the International Astronautical Congress. So I'm Alice Gorman. I'm going to be uh, the moderator for this event. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet today on the lands of the Ghana people and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So how we're going to uh, operate this morning's session is um, our wonderful astronauts, who hopefully will be a little more brightly lit shortly. Um, I'll ask them to very briefly tell us a bit about which missions they've been on. And you can see their names and the list of our panelists on the screen there. And after a little bit more discussion, we're going to be throwing the questions open to you, the audience. So there will be two microphone runners who uh, will be circulating around the hall. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, try and get the attention of a runner, and I'll be attempting to uh, facilitate that happening as well. So I don't think there's anything else official to say at the moment, except thank you all for coming to this wonderful event. And let's start to find out what life is like as an astronaut. So let's start with Krista, if you would like to tell us a little bit about what you have done in space and what missions you've been on. All right. So uh, my name is Krista Fugelsang and I'm from Sweden. I flew the space shuttle twice as a mission specialist, STS-116 and uh, 128 in 2006 and 2009. And it was during the assembly phase uh, of uh, the space station. And uh, the main things I did during this uh, flight were uh, several uh, spacewalks, EVAs. And uh, today I'm uh, working at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. I'm professor there and director of the KTH uh, Space Center. Thank you. We should applaud him. Uh, my name is Frank Culbertson. Um, there's two types of astronauts I've found. There are those who wanted to be an astronaut from the time they can remember, and others who accidentally became astronauts. I was committed to be an astronaut since I was 13. Uh, I served in the U.S. Navy as an aviator and was selected as an astronaut in 1984. I flew two shuttle missions, one as a pilot, STS-38, Atlantis, and then as a commander of Discovery on STS-51 in 1993. Uh, I was in management for a while and was a director of the Shuttle Mir program. Um, when that program ended, um, I really was not done flying, so I, uh, I, I bugged my boss until he gave me a flight, and I ended up as the commander of the third expedition to the International Space Station. We are now on the 53rd expedition, by the way. I retired from NASA in 2002, went into industry, and I've been with Orbital Sciences or Orbital ATK since 2008. I'm the president of the Space Systems Group, which delivers cargo to the space station, builds satellites, and we have a lot of fun. So great to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chiaki Mukai from Japanese Space Agency. And uh, we, uh, I'm the one of the first group of the Japanese astronaut, and I'm very much interested in utilizing the microgravity environment for research purposes. So my flight, I flew two times in the, in the space shuttle program, 1994 and 1998. The both flights are space laboratory type of mission, which has a lot of technical uh, evaluations, so microgravity science, life science. And by the way, my background is medicine. So I'm very much interested in utilizing the space environment for connecting something the similar or different <coughs> to the aging process. So that's what I do as a research. <coughs> also, right now I work for JAXA as a Japanese representative and also uh, the JAXA representative to work on the United Nations corpus, which is a committee on the peaceful uses of outer space. That's what I do. So thank you for having us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Michael Lopez Alegria. As you hear us all introduce ourselves, you'll find out that we have a lot in common with each other, even though we're from a lot of different countries. So like Frank, I was a Navy pilot before I became an astronaut. Uh, I flew three times on the space shuttle on uh, Columbia Discovery and Endeavor 
discovery with Pam. Uh, the first flight was like Chiaki, an, inter an international um, laboratory mission. So we had a module in the payload bay and we did experiments. The next two were ISS assembly missions like Christers. So we uh, brought up some pieces to the ISS, dock to it, took the arm, attached modules, <clears throat> and then did some spacewalks to configure it. And then my last mission was like Frank as commander of the uh, International Space Station Expedition 14, so about uh, 10 years ago. And now I'm uh, in Washington, D.C. as an independent consultant, working with both uh, private and government entities to help democratize access to space. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Dimitri Dorin Pronariu. I'm maybe the oldest one here. I flew into space 36 years ago in 1981 on board Salyut 6 space station and Soyuz 40. Uh, actually, I wanted to fly from my childhood, but I never thought that I could fly into space. And just a hazard changed my uh, path, uh, professional path, from airspace to space. And I was selected for an intercosmos program in 78. I flew for one week in May 81, and then I follow my career as a uh, specialist in, uh, in this field and uh, mostly at the international level as uh, first president of the Romanian Space Agency, then uh, representative of Romania to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, I joined the Association of Space Explorers. All of us are members of this association, and I had the privilege and uh, the honor to be the president president of this association from 2011-2014. And I continue to work uh, in uh, some very representative institutions connected with space. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Pam Melroy. Uh, my background was as an Air Force test pilot. Um, uh, so I uh, came to NASA and I flew three missions. I had the privilege of flying with uh, Mike Lopez Alegria on my first flight to the space station and with Sandy Magnus on my second flight to the space station. So all three missions were assembly missions, bringing up one or more pieces of the space station. Um, and I was able to command on my third flight. Um, uh, since I left NASA, I've been working um, a variety of industry and government positions, mostly focused on the commercialization of space technology. And I plan to move to Adelaide next year uh, to work on space. <laughs> uh, I'm Sergei Krikalev from Russia. Uh, I flew six flights. Um, first two on Mir station, it was Expedition 4, and then two, uh, two expeditions in one flight, Expedition 9 and Expedition 10. Uh, then I flew on shuttle. Um, twice, actually two and a half times, because um, uh, two missions was, uh, first was uh, STS-60, uh, first joint flight with uh, between Russia and the US, and second was STS-88, first assembly mission for, uh, for the space station. Uh, then I flew uh, two uh, station flights, uh, ST, uh, Expedition 1, uh, and we flew up on Soyuz and returned back on shuttle. That's why I said two and a half uh, shuttle missions. And then I was uh, commander of Expedition 11. Uh, since that, I'm in, in, managing, in management for a while, as Frank said. Um, I was um, head of uh, training center in Russia, and now I'm in Roscosmos responsible for human space flights. Actually, before I introduce myself, I think Sergey's being very modest. How many days in space? Cumul more than 800. 800, little more than 800 days. So, <laughs> very, very, very experienced space um, flyer. My name is Sandy Magnus. I'm a U.S. astronaut. I was in the class of 1996. I've flown three times. Uh, my first flight was Pam's second flight, STS-112 in 2002. We took a piece of the truss up to the space station and attached it. My second flight was a long duration flight, four and a half months on the space station as part of Expedition 18. Went up in November of 2008. We were the last three person crew and our job was to prepare the station for the six person crew that's currently up there now. 
My last flight was STS-135, which was the last shuttle flight uh, about six years uh, or so ago. I left the office in 2012, and I currently run the organization called the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, which is a professional technical society. And there's uh, quite a few AIAA members here in Australia, and it's always fun to come down and visit them. So thank you. Just before we move on, there's a couple of empty chairs up in the front row here, if anybody wants to come and grab them. So we have on our panel an incredible range and amount of experience on different space missions. But I'd like to get the ball rolling with the questions by asking if anyone has any thoughts on which of the very popular contemporary films that have been set in space recently, which of these do you think represents life in space most accurately. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I would say Apollo 13. Ah. Yeah. I think Apollo 13 is closest to to real story because <clears throat> each film is uh, is is movie and sometimes uh, pr uh, film producers add some s small details and sometimes not very small details. But <laughs> Apollo 13 is really close to life. Do you know? I, I'd like to say that. It may be not close to reality, but when I watched The Martian, that's really the only movie that made me feel homesick for space. Mm. And I think it has to do a lot with how the crew is interacting with each other and just kind of the mindset, even though it was a little science fiction-y and some of the stuff that was going on, but the, it's like, oh, I really miss doing that. That looks so much fun, you know. <laughs> so I'll throw out a, a different option. Um, there is a little known, not blockbuster movie, but very accurate, called uh, Space Station IMAX 3D. Some of us uh, were. So if you haven't seen it, it's about the assembly phase of the uh, International Space Station, and some of us were cameramen or actors or both, and uh, it's very accurate. <laughs> Just I, I want... Of course, I've seen all these movies, and I'm impressed by them, but uh, I was very impressed by the movie Gravity. Uh, it's a fantasy, but the details connected with any space object, any spacecraft, any space station, uh, the reality of movements inside and even outside, they are very, very well represented. Even if it's a fantasy, you can't fly just in your spacesuit from one space station to another one, <laughs> or, <laughs> or to do what Sandra Bullock did. But uh, the film is very representative of what represents space and the space problem. Uh, the space debris, you have seen what means space debris in that movie. Of course, everything was exaggerated a little bit, but uh, there is a reality that exists and they, they pose a real danger to those space flights. Well, actually, um, I was in the prequel to the ISS IMAX, Destiny of Space. <laughs> I was in the prequel to ISS IMAX, the Destiny in Space, where we filmed and acted and, and surveyed the shuttle with an IMAX camera, which was a lot of fun. And that was very realistic. Um, uh, I like both Apollo 13 and The Martian because they are solving problems that really could happen in space as a team, and very cleverly using engineering principles for the most part. Um, so I, I also like those. I had a problem with gravity. Um, I saw it in IMAX and surround sound, and it was like every nightmare I'd ever had about <laughs> being the commander of the shuttle of the station was occurring about every minute. And, uh, so but I, was a, I was a mess by the end of the movie. <laughs> Well, my case, uh, maybe a little bit different aspect, but the recent uh, the movie, it's not happening in the outer space, but uh, Hidden Figures oh. is the name. Mm. And it's, yeah. yeah. The, because uh, the reason why, uh, as Frank mentioned, the step space activities is a team effort. And then the not only the astronaut part, because you think that the astronauts are very visible. That's why you want to see the astronaut. But uh, we have thousands of people working together to make our dream happen. And then the hidden figures, there are three ladies who 
actually worked so hard in the very harsh and in a difficult environment, but they didn't forget about their dreams. So that's why mm. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think probably most of the audience shares your opinion about that wonderful film. Oh, wait, wait a second, though. I mean, come on. I, these are a lot of these are favorite movies of mine. But how can we not have at least an honorable mention for the dish? Oh, <laughs> yes. yes. If you haven't seen it, it is awesome, and it's actually about um, uh, the deep space tracking station here in Australia, where the first words from the moon were transmitted from, and uh, it's it's a lovely story. <laughs> but I believe it's not possible to play cricket on the actual dish itself. In case anybody has something. I think you're right. About that. Well, uh, I'll add my favorite space uh, movie, which may be a little bit exaggerated, but quite funny, at least Star Wars. <laughs> well, I think it's time to ask you, the audience, if you have any questions to ask our panel. So uh, we've got a microphone. Oh, someone has to grab a microphone from the stage as well. We're, because we had to move venues, we're a little shorter um, on microphones than we hope to be. Um, so, so our panellists will have to share their microphones very generously, but it sounds like that's um, par for the course for astronauts. Um, so our first question down here. That doesn't seem to be... Ah, OK, we might have to swap that. Do we have a second, do we have a second microphone have a on the space floor? Problem. <laughs> <laughs> Fix it, Ben. Uh, good morning. Thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. It's been fabulous so far. I was wondering if each of you could please tell us what your most unusual or interesting scientific experiment you've had to conduct in space. Unusual, interesting space experiment. Well, I guess for me it was when I spent about an hour and a half upside down doing nothing while all the other guys were working hard behind my back. They thought I was <laughs> cheating out, taking a little extra nap, but indeed I was doing an experiment where we were tracking uh, cosmic rays, particles going through my head, hopefully hitting my eye, and hopefully I would uh, notice this flash in my eye, the light flashes which is a known uh, phenomenon up there which we try to understand more, which I've been involved in scientifically also. And I managed to do that experiment while I was still on my second flight. I actually, or my first flight, and actually LA was the commander. So he probably saw me sleeping there. <laughs> um, I don't know if you'd call it interesting or not, but it was interesting. It wasn't my favorite experiment. Um, the doctors come up with all kinds of torture for us. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Mukai. But, um, but, but um, uh, we had an experiment where we were supposed to uh, attach electrodes to our leg and generate an electric shock and then measure it elsewhere in the body on a regular basis. Uh, mm, that doesn't sound uh, nice. Uh, yeah, and we didn't get any extra pay for that either. It was just, <laughs> I hope we got data for them. <laughs> well, I did a lot of experiments, and although my background, educational background, is life science and medicine, I had been very much fascinated by the fluid dynamics experiment. Any kind of experiment which requires crew to observe the uh, phenomena happening in space is very, very interesting. Like, for example, the one experiment I still remember is uh, if we just put, oh, there, there's a children, so you, I, I have to ask something to children. If, you, if we put some water here and put some, uh, the pour some oil, how do you see? Oil comes where? Top or bottom? Top. Why? Because the oil is uh, lighter than the uh, water, right? And then no matter how we work so hard, we cannot make water, oil, and water at top of the oil. Three layers. Can you? On Earth. <laughs> we can't. 
But in space, actually, there's no gravity at all. That's how we utilize the environment for microgravity science. We put water, and then at top of the water, oil layer, and then we can put the water, even at top of the oil, again, three layers. Mm. And then if we just, we just apply some uh, heat, uh, heat um, uh, the differences between right, and right side and left side, and then the surface between the oil and the water moves around in a different way. That observation, we never ever be able to do it on, on the ground. So we have so many interesting that kind of experiments that uh, requires crew to observe it. So those are the experiments that I was very much fascinated. I, I wish you could, you could see the three layers in future. <laughs> Chuck, you don't give us any hard questions like that about <laughs> what, what floats first. <clears throat> So yes, Christopher, I did see you hanging out upside down there. And what he didn't mention is um, before he put his head in this contraption, he had to put this cap on with a bunch of electrodes that were stuck to his scalp. So another movie, if you ever saw Back to the Future, Dr. Emmett Brown, he looked a lot like him. <laughs> so you said interesting and uh, what was the other adjective? Unusual. So. Um, in a long duration space flight, we're very interested to see how the body reacts over time to the microgravity environment. So uh, one of the experiments that we had to do was to take fluid samples um, every few weeks throughout the mission to see what the metabolic changes were like. So the first fluid is blood. And it was interesting to learn how to draw your own blood with, you know, with one hand. And um, I would say that all, on, all but one occasion, I was pretty successful at it. <laughs> The second fluid is urine, and you would think that would be the easier of the two. I'll just leave it to say it was not. <laughs> Actually, my background is uh, airspace engineering. And uh, to fly into space, I had to learn a lot about other sciences, physics, medicine, uh, biology, psychology. Uh, but in the same time, we had some interesting facts up there uh, about uh, which we never thought. By instance, uh, during the adaptation to the weightlessness, I had a lot of strange things happening with my body. One of them was that I was very tired in the first days, and one of the day, the third or the fourth day after uh, we docked to the space station, in one afternoon, just during a break, I fall asleep floating in the air. So, you know, uh, you, you take the position of the fetus inside the mother, yes, when the muscles are more relaxed. And my guys, uh, my crew said that uh, watching at me, they try to play a little bit and they push me like a ball from one side to another one. I didn't know anything about that, but it was really an experiment for them. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, actually, my favorite experiment, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not actually even sure what any of the scientific results were. Um, it turned out to be very useful to me. So we wore these um, these watches, and they were. I think the the science was intended to track your light exposure because, um, of course, you go around the Earth every 90 minutes, and so 45 minutes in sunlight, 45 minutes in dark, you can see it kind of messes with your body clock, um, kind of like coming to Australia. So um, the idea was that it would track the amount of light and it would also track how much sleep you had based on your arm movements. And uh, for me, what was really fascinating was going back and looking at how much I slept on each flight, especially if it was like the night before a really big event or something like that. And so it's, it's those things are actually very hard to be completely aware of. I guess it was sort of a precursor to the Fitbit or something. Um, but now, um, you know, being able to go back and say, you know, how, what nights did I get the best sleep, and um, and think about that for my crew and think about that for future flights was actually incredible helpful to me. So uh, I think uh, they're still looking at the results of uh, melatonin and other things and whether it helped us sleep or not. Well, about experiments and different flights were different experiments and many of them were interesting. I would say 
uh, one of most interesting for me was uh, plasma crystal. Uh, we started this experiment. Actually, it was first uh, non-medical, sorry, <laughs> non-medical uh, uh, experiment on Expedition 1. And it, it was continued for several flights. And uh, scientists um, get data in very many different fields. Uh, start from uh, crystallography. And um, th uh, they even uh, improve some models how planets were formed uh, based on the results of, uh, of this experiment. Another experiment I would mention is experiment we did on Mir station when we assembled a pretty big structure uh, and uh, the technique how to, uh, to assemble it uh, was to, using, uh, to use um, memory alloy, I guess it, that's how it's called. It's a special um, structure that when you hit the uh, part of the element, the, the metal has a memory and it memorizes what, uh, what shape it was uh, before it was hit. And uh, this, uh, this was a pretty interesting technique. We were not even sure that this structure would be rigid enough. But it was rigid, and then we used uh, this structure to, uh, to control station in a row. So you can talk about many experiments. And they were very unusual, uh, very specific for space. Uh, but I think, um, looking in general, I think the biggest experiment we're still doing in space is assembling the station and uh, operating the station. Because people forget that even station design and station assembly is a big technical experiment. And it's experiment with international partnership because we are also learning how to operate this uh, station together. And it's uh, what Mekit said. It's not only uh, crew on board, but it's also big team on the ground that, uh, that is learning how to operate together in order to use the result of this experiment for future missions. So in Expedition 18, we had a, a couple of spiders um, in a payload. It was an educational payload. It was a self-contained little box. And they were spiders that, for some reason, destroy their webs every night and build new webs every day. And so it, it was a sort of an experiment to see if microgravity would affect how they build their webs. And I, you know, observing them day after day for, for a few months, I didn't really notice any trends in how they were building their webs. But the interesting thing that I observed watching the experiment were the fruit flies. So because these spiders were going to be up there for months and months, you know, the, the box they were in had to be self-contained. And they had put fruit flies in the box with the spiders as a source of food. Fruit flies reproduce, don't live very long, and they reproduce very quickly. So there were several generations of fruit flies that had born and died and been born and died during the course of the several months. And what was interesting to see was how the fruit flies evolved to be in microgravity. They quit flying because they quit using their wings because they didn't need them anymore, right? So, so it was interesting to watch them as a species kind of evolve because that was a long time for them, months and months and months when you consider they just live for day to day. So that was fascinating to me. The spiders were fun uh, and they built some very interesting webs, but the, how the fruit flies evolved was the most interesting part of that experiment. They were born without wings later? <laughs> I don't recall if they were born without wings, but they were definitely not using them. I don't know if you've ever had mice on your flight, but the way mice have adapt, too, is pretty fascinating. Do you need the microphone, Frank? Oh, that's OK. Oh, that's OK. Move on. Um, our next question is down here. Can we have a, a microphone to this gentleman, please? Thinking about the fruit flies, it does make you wonder what might happen to the human body in the long term in microgravity. <laughs> As uh, more private companies get involved in uh, space exploration and space travel, what excites you? Does that excite you or scare you, and why? Who'd like to start? So I actually, it's it's really exciting. You know, one of the things I think that we will all agree up here on the stage is we're we're working towards collectively the the uh, possibility that more and more people can engage in spaceflight, both personally and you know, uh, via machines and things like that. So to see, after 50 years of effort, some some um, uh, energy in that concept of expanding the access to space for more and more people is really great. Now, it's still hard, right? Space flight is still hard. There's a reason why it's taken 50 years to get to the point where we're just starting 
to expand the access to space. And as more and more entities that are non-governmental get into it, um, we're going to learn a lot. And there's going to be some rough times. And we just have to remember that we have to continue to power through that. So we still have a lot of lessons ahead of us. But overall, the trend is really good. And I, I think it's very, very exciting. Uh, since I now work for one of the several companies that are providing commercial services to the International Space Station, um, I'm very excited about it and it's working very well overall. I'd like to point out one thing though, from the very beginning of the space era, in all the countries involved, it's been commercial private companies that have actually provided a lot of the workforce and the resources and the know-how to do this under contract to various governments and agencies. So there's been a partnership from the very beginning. Uh, it's just a matter of who ultimately owns the product, who owns the requirements and the performance of the system. Now that commercial companies are in it, the, for example, the one I know the most about is the commercial resupply contract that um, under which we provide the Cygnus spacecraft for delivery of cargo to the station. We own the launch vehicle or we purchase it from ULA in some cases. We own the spacecraft. <clears throat> before it gets to the station and after it leaves the station, we're responsible for its operation. When we get to the station, we have to comply with all the NASA requirements in order to be approved for the final approach, meaning we have to be human rated and everything has to be performing. But other than that time frame, when we're approaching or attached to the station, it's our spacecraft and we have full responsibility for it. That's a different thing and it actually took me quite a while when I joined the Orbital to train NASA <laughs> not to act the way they used to in terms terms of wanting to change everything or control everything. I said, it's ours, our requirements. If you don't like it, don't accept us on board. But we're the ones responsible for how it's designed and, and how it's built. And you're going to see more and more of that. You're going to hear a lot about it uh, today and, <clears throat> excuse me, and actually forever because I think you're going to see increasing partnerships between commercial industry and what's going on and eventually purely commercial activities to eventually include purely commercial astronauts who are going to a facility in space to produce products or, or to do observations, do experiments on a commercial basis. So it's going to continue to grow. And I also believe that the international collaboration and cooperation will continue to grow because the further we go out into space, the less any one organization can afford to do it. Uh, question down here. Yes, you. Microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, we'll go to you first and then this one over here. I have to get my, get time to get my attention. Thank you, everyone, for um, presenting today. I wanted to ask a question about your perception of the Earth. So the astronauts that go up into the International Space Station get to see Earth from a very different perspective, and they get to see its fragility and beauty um, in a way that nobody else has. What do you see as the future for our priorities to look after our planet after having seen that? Um, well, w w when you're up there, it, it's uh, much more um, hits you than something which, of course, everyone can understand. But I mean, our Earth is a huge spacecraft for all humanity. And you really see how thin the atmosphere is, our environment, which we better take care of. We're very concerned about the environment we have in our spacecraft to make sure we survive. And um, that becomes very obvious that we need to do the same thing for the environment on Earth. You don't see any borders. You want to want to be fight around those imaginary lines down there on, on Earth, on the space station. When I was there the second time, we were 13 astronauts from five different countries. We had problems, but we did our best to help each other and solve it together all the time. And uh, to catch on on the previous question, you know, we, we, I think it would be really good the more people can go to space. And I know astronauts often joke that, well, if you just could send all the politicians up to space, there will be no more wars. Because I understand we have to take care of this together. I think if we took the time for each of us to answer, we'd more or less all say the same thing Christopher said in eight different ways. So I, I, we're firmly in agreement. 
So those are some excellent words to be hearing today. Oh, Just a couple of quick things to add. And Sergei was in orbit when a major transition occurred between the Soviet Union and the, and the Russian state. And I'm sure he could talk more about that. Um, I happened to be in space on uh, September the 11th, 2001. So I also saw a, a major event down here on Earth from space. Every 90 minutes, I saw the effects of that on the US and had friends who were involved in that. Um, so you can see amazing things from space. But the thing that continued to be true, and the message I kept getting while I was up there and even after I returned, is that the more we can collaborate and cooperate internationally, the less likely we are to repeat these type of events. They are very startling and, and frightening from space. But as you go around, as all of these people will attest, you don't actually see the boundaries. You see some of the ecological problems. And I saw a change from my first flight to my most recent flight on, in the Earth in terms of pollution. But we've got to figure out a way to, to work together. Uh, I met a veteran of the war in Afghanistan who had lost both his legs there. And as we were chatting, I mentioned I had seen some of that activity from above. And he said, were you in a C-130 or what? And I said, no, a little higher. And we finally got to the space station. And he immediately changed his tone and said, that's exactly what we have to be doing, is international teams building great things so we don't have to go over there and fight anymore. So I just I wanted to add just one thing uh, regarding my feelings up there into space. So actually, during my all space flight, I had two opposite feelings. One of them was uh, of a very powerful man, a powerful person, as a human being that built such a space technology that you can fly above the atmosphere and see the Earth and make a lot of experiments in weightlessness. And the other feeling was of the vulnerability. You are just a small bean inside a spacecraft, a very small one. So I've flown Salute 6, it's one module space uh, station. And any time you could be hit by a micrometeorite, by a space debris, and just disappear. And all these feelings just mix somehow during the space flight and uh, gave me a very, very complex uh, feeling about uh, my flight and my uh, existence up there on board the space station. It will be interesting in the future. More of us will be able to go into space, hopefully, and we can form our own um, perceptions of how, how these effects work. Now, we have a, a, a gentleman here. Then I think it's you next. Then um, <laughs> um, we'll get through these two, and then I'll, I'll raise this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we know that for uh, historical reasons, uh, the organization in the space crew has always been very military, um, with the crew commander at the top. Do you think that this is still the best way of organizing a space crew, or should we be thinking about other ways of organizing a, uh, a space crew and the leadership f in extreme environments, such as when we go to Mars, for example? I may express an opinion. Uh, actually, the first cosmonauts and astronauts were selected from the military staff because they were well prepared for uh, special situations, for any uh, thing that could appear into outer space, just to face very tough situations. That was the reason they were selected in the beginning as military persons. I'm also a military person. I'm a three-star general now. But uh, when I was selected, I was a civilian one, and I joined the Air Force just because of the implication in logistical problems. They were the organizers of our stay in Star City. And it was easier for us to work in this respect. But I didn't accomplish any military experiment. So, and uh, most of us uh, were, were not involved in military experiments, even if we uh, are military persons. Uh, of course, they are dedicated experiments uh, for uh, Air Force, for uh, different ministries of defense, but this is separate from uh, the experience we had in the outer space. So I think, you know, when you have a mission, somebody has to be in charge. You can't have a mission by committee, right? But having said that, when, when we work as a crew, even though there's a commander of the mission who's nominally in charge, everybody on this, the team brings different skill sets. So for example, during the spacewalks, the people who were really in charge at that moment were the two spacewalkers and then the internal uh, vehicle manager, if you will. Or when we were doing robotics, the robotics people were sort of in charge. So it's, 
It's a team environment and we all count on each other to bring our skill sets to the table at their best and our teammates are counting on us that when we're doing the things that we were brought to the mission for, they're counting on us to lead in that position. So you have to, you can't think of it as there's a commander and it's very rigid and everybody salutes and goes down, right? Because it's much more collaborative than that, but you have to have somebody in charge. You can't have any enterprise anywhere where there's not one belly button that's making the final decisions. But you can do that in a very collaborative way and that's the powerful way to do it and that's the way we work no matter where, whether we're military, our scientists, our medical doctors, or what country we're from, that's how we work. I, I think we should add that many commanders in the space station has been orders since a long time non-military. For example, a classmate of Sandy Min, uh, Peggy Whitson, has been uh, you know, the record time of a woman in space. Uh, she's been commander up there twice. So, I mean, uh, there's nothing today that says there's some military has to be the commander, or it's very little, the commander has to command, really, as Sandy pointed out. And actually, I would add uh, to this that uh, really in the beginning, uh, we had kind of rule that uh, military person uh, was a commander, but for many years already, crew assignment is done uh, based on, on uh, an experience. So we have international crew, and uh, basically most experienced person is assigned as a crew commander. And in any organization, you have to have a leadership structure to a certain extent, as has already been said. But the most Im important part of that is not the authority of being the leader. It's the responsibility that goes with that. And someone has to accept that responsibility uh, throughout the division of labor. I think our next question is down here. Thank you very much for coming here today and sharing your time and thoughts with us, especially as we are all getting started on our journey down into space, well, up into space, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, I was wanting to ask you about what you see as the future for the commercialization of space, particularly with respect to potential for commercial astronauts or uh, astronauts that are actually going into space for the purposes of, say, colonization or forming a base on another planet, an asteroid, uh, for the purposes <laughs> of either commercial or settlement. Thank you. Well, may I start? Uh, I think sometimes people are kind of opposing to, to meaning, uh, professional and commercial. Uh, in our case, it's actually happened in uh, flying in air. Because if you have commercial airline, it doesn't mean that pilot wouldn't be professional. So probably the same will happen in space flight. Uh, maybe uh, there is going to be uh, commercial missions, but uh, probably astronaut will stay professional anyway. Yeah, I'd like to jump on that because that's a, the exact analogy, Sergey. That's the way I think about it too. Um, think about what how aviation would impact our world today if the only people who did it were, uh, you know, military or governments, right? So that would be crazy. You can't even imagine it. I mean, it's so dominated by the commercial market. Um, but there are military pilots, and there are also private pilots. And there are bush pilots and, um, you know, people who uh, fly for a variety of different reasons. And I think that's what we should hope to see in the future is this very robust ecosystem of, uh, you, of going to space for a lot of different reasons. And, uh, you know, there's a code, right? When pilots are in trouble, we help each other. So if somebody goes down, you know, you, you stay there if you can or you call out, hey, I saw the airplane went down or you stay if you, if you can and things like that. And I think you'll see exactly the same thing happen in space. And the other aspect of that is the business aspect. Business will continue to expand as the exploration moves into the exploitation stage, just as it has on every continent on Earth, as well as in the air and under the sea. As the governments blaze the trail and, and make it accessible, people will come in and try to make money doing it. And we've seen that over and over and over again over the centuries. We'll see exactly the same thing in space, I believe. Uh, Sarah, Jay. Thank 
Uh, thank you so much. I, uh, you being here and also this being um, the week that we announced on Australian Space Station, I'm sure you have inspired many, many Australians uh, to consider the prospect of becoming astronauts. So I have a personal question uh, for you, not so much um, professional, but that is one, uh, do you dream in space? And the other, when you, the night you return to Earth, do you still feel the micro, the embodied microgravity sensation as you're falling to sleep? Mm. Well, I uh, I can tell you yes, and I had some really weird dreams in space. Anyway, I, I don't know what the deal was with that, but um, the first time I came back from space, um, I fell asleep fine, and I woke up in the middle of the night. And I didn't know where I was. And uh, all I could think of was, oh my gosh, something, I, I got stuck somewhere. And something is crushing me. And it's crowding me and almost suffocating me. And I kind of looked around. You get sort of comfortable in space being a little confused. Because you know there's no up or down. And so you don't always, you're not always oriented immediately. And I saw this um, long pole sticking straight out next to me as I looked at it and I thought, what is that? Just trying to think, where could it be? What, what feature is that? And then I had this massive sudden reorientation and I realized I was lying in bed. The thing that was suffocating me was gravity and that was the lamp on the table next to the bed. <laughs> I went, oh, that's where I am. <laughs> so it does take a little adjustment. When I was on my space station mission, um, I dreamed, I dreamt, but I didn't dream about being in space until after I did a spacewalk. And then I dreamed about it all the time. And the mm -hmm. most vivid one was I remember dreaming that I could go home on weekends on a space elevator and come back to the station for the work <laughs> week, which <laughs> made it a lot easier. And then when I, actually when I got back from my first mission, uh, I had fallen asleep. And one of my kids was asleep next to me, and I remember waking up and putting my hand on him so he didn't float away. Oh, do you want, and then you, yeah. Chiaki, I'm interested to know if you've had any dreams me? in space or on the ground. I am a very practical person, and <laughs> <laughs> so I, I might have some dream, but I don't remember. <laughs> uh, both in the space and uh, on the, also the ground. But actually, the, the thing that I was uh, very, very much fascinated was when I came back to us was the gravity, the existence of gravity. So before going to space, I understand there's no gravity over there. And then, but when I came back, I just realized how strongly mm. the gravity actually pulled us down to the center of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So if I just drop something like this, it, it, to me, the first time when I came back, I thought, oh, it is not falling. It just attracted uh, mm -hmm. by the center of the Earth, like a, ah. like, a, yeah, like a magnet. So it says everything, the speed was so fast. And then I was so fascinated, so I dropped so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I was glad, oh, <laughs> it, it was <laughs> but, but you know that the human body has a great adaptability. So it only uh, takes two to three days to get adapted to the microgravity, uh, the, to the gravity environment. So the second night when I came back, I felt, oh my God, if I just sleep tonight, maybe tomorrow morning I forget. I will, uh, uh, my sense of memory yes. will go on. So I was so sad. So that was uh, because uh, that was a very, very interesting situation because Unless you leave this gravity environment to put, uh, to put your body uh, exposed to the different environment, you'll never know this Earth environment is very, very special. So mm. the space is special, but to me, Earth even more special. 
Thank you, Chucky. Did Just a you? thought about uh, dreaming, dreaming not in the other space, but after the space flight. So I'm also a very practical person like Chucky is, <laughs> and I don't remember dreaming anything, even if I dream the night, but in the morning I don't remember anything. Uh, long time after the space flight, being so impressed during the space flight by the mountains, and especially by the Himalaya mountains, I just thought that they break the sky, they are very high, and you see the peaks of these mountains. And I was so impressed that many years after my space flight, I dreamed maneuvering the space station through the mountains like an airplane, flying with that through the mountains and looking on one side, on the other side. But was the space station. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a true feat. I'll give you another graphic description. Right after the wheels stopped on the shuttle on my first mission, and I remember trying to move my body position, my first thought was, gravity sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll take, um, I think the first hand up was tall person whose name I've forgotten. And then we'll take another question on this side. Thank you. So uh, one more time, thank you for being here. And just a really quick question back to your emotions and feelings. Uh, when it comes to when you're on top of thousands and thousands of kilograms of high flammable material and thousands of particles, everything ready to be engaged in the next 60 seconds, and you're just waiting for the word launch, what are your feelings? You know how I was actually really excited because I'd been dying to go to space for my whole life and I was finally getting to go. And so um, you also, I think, feel a lot of pressure of not letting the team down. So I was kind of two people, right? I was a mission, I was the flight engineer on my first mission, so my job was to help the pilot and the commander keep track of the shuttle systems, and that was a very serious job. And so my brain was sort of split into two. My, one brain, part of my brain was really focused, okay, I gotta do this job, and the other part of my brain was that 12-year-old girl going, oh, I'm getting to go to space, it's so cool. You know? <laughs> so that's kind of what was going through my mind. I'm sure it's not that much different with everybody else, but I'll pass the mic around. Well, I, actually, you, you're uh, sitting there or laying on your back for a couple of hours locked in, not much to do, and uh, half sleep most of the time. Uh, <laughs> Several years, when uh, 14 years before that, when I got selected as an astronaut, I was thinking, wow, I wonder if I'm be able to even sleep the night before I go to space, and was be, will be pretty nervous, I'm sure. Well, when I get there, when I got there, I mean, you felt so well prepared for what you're going to do. Thanks to all the good trainers and instructors, by the way, that. Uh, well, okay, this is not, a, not really not a normal day on the work, but uh, uh, I was not nervous. I slept just as well that night before going there, and uh, not much to do. You were waiting. I was down on the mid deck, so I was not like Sandy. I had no responsibility unless things would go really bad, and I was responsible to open the hatch and help us j jump out, but um, I didn't <laughs> expect that. So I was not responsible for anything, so I didn't have any pressure on me. And only maybe five minutes before, uh, or two minutes before you're told to close your, your visor, th then you start to get a bit, a bit excited. But not so much when you're scared, but now finally going to space, and okay, a little bit risky, for sure. <laughs> so that was, um, um, man, it was a great uh, time. And actually, I would add that for many of us, uh, being uh, uh, ready to the first flight is a very long road. So uh, getting ready to, to launch, uh, it's actually um, kind of you review uh, all the previous path because you, you're going through uh, training, you're going through educational process, and uh, actually there are many steps where you can d uh, you can change direction. So uh, it's not very easy to get to, to this point to get ready to start, and that's actually kind of turning moment between not being f flown and after the flight. Yeah, I completely agree with the thoughts, and it's very exciting to finally be there. Um, in fact, on my first flight after the SRBs left and it got very quiet, I had to remind myself I wasn't back in the simulator because it's so smooth now and, and it was dark outside. I couldn't see anything except for the instruments and the altitude going through 100,000 feet and Mach 12. I knew we were going. But 
I had another experience, a little bit different, maybe a couple people did, but on my second mission and our fourth launch attempt, um, we were sitting on the rocket, the engines ignite, and at three seconds they all shut down. And so that's a totally different feeling than having them light and get off the pad because you're just sitting there kind of swaying in the breeze. Nobody's more than or less than three and a half miles from you and you have to wait about an hour before they can get you out of there. So it's a little bit little bit different feeling. But you know you're eventually gonna go. And then the system did its job and you're safe. So unfortunately I can't say that uh uh, experience of my previous flights, so I had only one flight and everything happened during that flight. Um, I remember that our flight was scheduled in the beginning on 11 of uh, May, 81. Then we were set that maybe on 12. Uh, on 12, uh, if I remember, was a Sunday. They said during the weekend our workers don't work very properly, so let's wait till Monday. So that, these were the rumors. I don't know exactly what was there, but the flight was delayed for three days, and uh, finally we went up on 14. Uh, you understand that emotions and uh, the feelings, uh, knowing that everything was delayed, maybe f by some technical reasons, uh, brings you in a different position that just staying quite relaxed and waiting for the space flight. But at the same time, after many, many, many hours in the simulator, and the simulator is exactly inside like a spacecraft, when we lay on uh, our chairs in the spacecraft, I just consider that I'm a, in a simulator during a normal training. Okay, I knew that this is the real space flight, but I didn't feel anything different till the moment when the rocket started to push us up. And I feel the gravity, I feel the Gs, and then I said, wow, this is a real one. <laughs> I think it's fascinating that all the answers so far, nobody has talked about the concept of fear, which I think is maybe at the root of the question. I think that what happens is, First of all, like everybody said, it, it takes most people so long to get to that moment that the time to be afraid of it has long since passed. Plus, you've made that conscious decision yourself. It's not like someone stuck you on the rocket and said, you know, strapped you in. They do, I mean, that said, they say that when a rocket lights, there's 10,000 things that could happen and only one of them is good. And I, I would say that that kind of goes through your mind, but. What I can't emphasize enough is, um, so in, in uh, footy, in Australian football, there's a clock, right? And as the clock counts down to zero, when your team is ahead, you know, you sort of can't wait for those numbers to tick down until you get to zero. And there's nothing like watching the countdown clock from being strapped in, knowing that when it gets to zero, except in Frank's case, apparently, you're, <laughs> you're actually going to launch. It is an unbelievable um, accumulation of energy, all this training you've gone through, and you know the sensations are going to be unbelievable. It's, it's a wonderful experience. Our next question is uh, Brett. Can we have the microphone, please? Then we're going to, and then we're going to move down the back on this side. Uh, thank you. Um, fascinating. Um, right from the beginning of the space age, a manned space flight, um, we, be, we were aware that uh, there were two major medical problems. Loss of the bone, bone structure, and cardiovascular or heart and blood vessel laziness. And I wrote a review in 1964 of the first uh, results from the uh, Mercury program, and, that, and I wrote that up then. And we are still facing bone loss and cardiovascular deconditioning. And I wondered if the astronauts had any idea about whether we will need to have artificial gravity on spacecraft mm -hmm. or whether we can get to Mars with our astronauts intact enough to carry out their functions on the surface. So I think the long duration people will probably answer this, but I we, we have protocols where if you exercise following the exercise <coughs> protocols every day, you can come back without any bone loss or any muscle atrophy or any cardiovascular changes. I came back basically the same person physiologically I was when I left. So we've actually conquered that. So the question about whether or not we would need artificial gravity goes a lot to the trade-offs between exercise protocols and exercise equipment and habitability versus the complexity of adding that design in. But we really have that conquered. 
with the exercise protocols, and I'll hand it over to, like Sergey was up for over 800 days and, and has more experience than I do, but I felt perfectly comfortable. And of course, uh, of course, we have some problems. Uh, it's fluid shift, and because of that, is uh, cardiovascular uh, problems. And uh, as Sandy said, that we know how to to fight with it. But uh, discussing artificial gravity, we are actually trading our space flight conditions to uh, uh, comfort uh, for human. And if we put uh, human comfort as the first phase, uh, probably better not to fly anywhere. Most comfortable mm -hmm. thing is to sit in a chair, <laughs> not to fly, and it, it would be normal. So it's, it's, it's okay for us even to have some, some problems, uh, because uh, we are flying not in usual conditions, and these unusual conditions let us do some experiments, uh, including studying human body, including, uh, as I said, uh, crystal growing, including biological experiment growing uh, protein crystals. So um, if we have uh, spacecraft that that is going to be pretty complex uh, with artificial gravity, the only way we can know how to do this is making turn of this uh, spacecraft and it should be pretty big arm for this uh, rotation. But in this case, uh, observations are going to be difficult. Uh, you cannot do all experiments uh, you, you do in weightlessness. Uh, so this is a trade-off. Well, actually, uh, compared to the 1960s, uh, the medical, the life science, and uh, the space medicine has a lot of data accumulated. So, uh, like Sandy mentioned, the bone and the muscle issue has almost solved. But of course, it's not completely yet. And then, but uh, maybe when we think about the exploration from Mars or uh, uh, Moon or Mars for long enough, then the radiation issue becomes more important. But and going back to your question about the artificial gravity, my first flight that is called International Microgravity, the second mission, is a wonderful experiment from DLR, German Space uh, Agency, provided some device uh, organized by European Space Agency to test the threshold of the gravity. Uh, like uh, here, we have one G, one gravitational force. And there's no way for us to test if 1G is appropriate to our body or not. We may need maybe a little bit less uh, gravitational uh, the, the force. Like, uh, let's say, if it's uh, 0 0.5, then our body weight becomes a half. People who says, I'm a handicap so that I cannot support my body weight, now freely move around. So the gravity has something like that. But actually, our body was designed and born in the gravitational field, which is 1G. So we don't know what is the appropriate gravitational level to our body. And maybe different body system has a different threshold. But um, interestingly enough, the result of that uh, European Space Agency's one, maybe 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 gravitational force is the level of the threshold, which means we recognize, oh, here, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, now there is a, a gravity force exists. If we think about the moon, it's only 1.6 g. So if we have some uh, the living condition or space colony or Mars, what well, Mars has uh, even the higher the G, so this is maybe okay. But Moon, we might need some uh, artificial gravity for the people living long enough on a Moon environment. But we don't know the, how much we need. Less, it's easier for the engineers to develop the device. That's, that is a, uh, the current situation. Very interesting. Uh, our next question over here. Is this on? Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My only credential on this very prestigious forum is as an Earthling on Spaceship Earth. And I, I just look at some of the, uh, the wider questions. Uh, we are moving exponentially into this extraordinary frontier of space travel. And you as our pioneers um, in this uh, 
extraordinary quantum jump that we are doing in human endeavors. Are we keeping up with the excitement and with the you know extraordinary things we are looking at? Are we keeping up with the backroom stuff that is happening? Are we managing our space junk? And are we even thinking of managing our space junk as that's going to follow us exponentially? Are we, are we um, moving at the exponential rate with our peace treaty so that we do have an international collaboration as, as we move forward? Because when things go wrong out there, um, they're going to go wrong down here. So I'm interested in your comments. A couple of different aspects to what you were asking. Um, one is, um, we're, as, even when we go as fast as we can, we're never going fast enough because we need to be doing more and more. And the problem with that is money, politics, and communication between the various entities involved. Uh, and there's always obstacles to that. So w those of us in this room probably would go, you know, light speed as fast as we could to get more, further and further out into space. But the reality is we can't quite do that. And we have to do it safely. Um, the other aspect is in keeping up with the, 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 the junk, as you said, of, um, of what we're doing, um, I know many of you have heard the story of what's left over at the top of Everest from all the explorers and people who've gone up there. They haven't brought any of that down to speak of. Well, uh, space debris is a problem, and we've seen some instances of it causing major problems to spacecraft up there. And being in the commercial industry building satellites, I'm very concerned about space debris, but that's a very difficult problem because everything's in a different orbit. And it's not like Star Wars, where you can fly from orbit to orbit very easily. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to do that. But it's a problem we have to solve, or it's going to become uh, potentially catastrophic, because a few collisions that start a chain reaction are, are going to make it very difficult to operate, either in LEO or GEO. And so uh, all of us here are very concerned about how do we manage that. Actually, one a few words about uh, this problem. The international community is very concerned about all these problems, about the space junk, and about other problems connected with the safety of space flights. I uh, had the opportunity, me and Chaki Mukai, to be chairmen of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. I was twice. She was the chairman of the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee. And uh, at this level, the problem of the space debris is discussed from a long, long time, and long time ago, many years ago, were adopted some recommendations for space agencies and for nations, for all uh, institutions involved in the space activity. And uh, step by step, these recommendations are applied by space agencies. So, uh, but they are not yet mandatory. It's, it's quite impossible to, to set something mandatory from the very beginning, but most of these recommendations become mandatory in time. And really, we are concerned about these problems. Yeah, I would just add, there is a lot of um, uh, international concern and recognition of the space traffic management and orbital debris problems. Um, it, it's a little bit analogous to climate change insofar as everybody recognizes it's a problem, but uh, implementing the change is, um, in general, expensive and businesses don't like to lose money. And so what is the mechanism by which you impose some sort of international regulation? And I think that the efforts that Doreen mentioned which start internationally, but then can filter through the uh, national regulatory bodies. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> the FCC, which grants licenses to uh, satellites in the US, now has started implementing the notion that you've got to guarantee that your satellite will effectively not be a contributor to this problem. That doesn't help all the stuff that's already on the top of Mount Everest, so to speak, but it, there is growing concern, and I'd say attention being paid to it both uh, internationally and domestically. Well, I'd like to add there's a physics uh, piece of this which I don't think we fully understand yet. Uh, unlike Mount Everest, things in low Earth orbit generally do spiral, spiral in and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, like a biological system, it is self-healing eventually. Um, the higher things are, the longer they take. And uh, if it's uh, a 1,000 years, that's not very helpful to us now. If it's less than 20 years, um, I think 
uh, that's why it's so important not to make things worse. Uh, because it does have the potentially to he to potential to heal itself over a period of time in low Earth orbit. But we're operating in other orbits, more in, for example, geosynchronous orbit, which is 10% of the way to the moon. And that stuff is never coming back. I mean, it's just really not, at least not like in a million years. And so what happens today is if you have a telecommunications satellite in geo and you're finished with it, you boost it up to what's called the graveyard orbit, um, you know, 500 kilometers above uh, all the other uh, geo satellites. Well, someday that is going to be, no one is talking about that right now. No one is talking about that because that is a really big problem. That is not a self-healing system, and it is a bunch of stuff up there. So I think uh, as we tackle one problem, it's very important to focus on LEO. That's where we have people now, high-value assets like the space station. Um, but this is not over, right? And I think there are other things that we are going to find as we push out into the solar system that um, we're going to be grappling with this problem for a long time. One other aspect is uh, individual and corporate responsibility, taking responsibility for what you're doing, whether there's regulations or not. Most societies and cultures around the world now are aware of whether they're littering their cities or not. They're aware of clean energy, doing the right thing to help preserve the environment, whether they're required to or not. And, and uh, that's contributing to improved environment on the Earth. People who are going into space have to do the same thing, and most companies and most governments are doing that. The regulation part is going to have to eventually help push that, and we're going to have to solve some of the more difficult problems like GEO before it really is uh, a safe environment. Okay. And there was another part of this question is about excitement and about uh, our motivation to do what we do, and this is a question not for us because we were excited many years ago and that's why we are doing what we what we did but i think the answer is right here uh, you you can maybe look around and see that this room doesn't fit everyone who wanted to be here because people are standing in behind and that means that uh, we as a humanity still have excitement people are interested in it and i see young kids and they probably will continue what we are doing now and because they are here i i have a hope and let me point out one more thing that may be obvious to most of you in here, but once you get involved in this field, once you're in aerospace, there are programs that might help you try to get out of it, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> the space bug is incurable. The space bug is incurable. Now, I'd, I'd like um, to give someone way down the back on this side a chance to ask a question. The white-haired person waving their hand at me right now. Our poor, hard-working microphone runner is doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Um, my question relates to President Kennedy's uh, famous statement that we're going to go to the moon. And in 69 we were there and I, uh, I, I, I still have vivid recollections of watching that on the black and white TV at the time. But three years later we stopped going to the moon and I suspect we traded off the the costs to the International Space Station. Today we're now talking about going to Mars and still we haven't yet gone to the Moon and I would expect the Moon to play an integral part on any further interplanetary ex uh, exploration. Maybe you, I would like your comments on, uh, on that. We could take several hours debating that. Uh, and it's been a topic of discussion at the conference here. What order do we do things? What's required for the steps to eventually get to Mars? And people are working on that very hard. And I, and I think the Deep Space Gateway will be one of the first steps. And then it's specifically what we do after that, people will, will figure that out. But I, we're going to have to do it as an international community, in my, my opinion. And so that means we're going to have to work out a lot of differences and, and make compromises on goals but bring everything to bear. I'd like to address the Apollo question uh, because I think it's incredibly important, especially as Australia goes forward uh, with the space agency. Um, it was not the goal of the Apollo program to keep going back. If you listen carefully, it was to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. And so the program was never structured to be a sustaining environment 
right? It's just it's a huge logistics tale to take care of people, as uh, those who lived aboard the space station and uh, companies like Frank's that that provide commercial supplies to the space station. That is a massive, massive logistics effort. And uh, we, we have learned a lot from doing it in low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. At some point, though, if we want to go to Mars, if it's not just going to be like Apollo, where it's a one-off, where we send someone there, and they come back, and we all dance around, and then nothing happens for 60 years again, um, we can't have it that way. And that's one of the, the things that is, to me, most exciting about the commercial providers, because uh, we have to have that logistics tail. For people who came to to America and Australia, the reason why they could come is because there was a shipping industry where they had commercial boats and they could buy a ticket uh, and, and come and hope that they would get supplies that they couldn't build in situ and mail and things like that. And I think um, the moon is, is an important consideration uh, because you can imagine that a logistics structure probably is going to need to need caches and waypoints and things like that. And, and so um, I, I think uh, as, as inspiring as Apollo was for all of us, I hope that we're thinking about Mars in a more sustainable way. Yeah, I, I think it's, a, to me, a kind of no-brainer. It takes a few days to go to the moon. It takes uh, today, with today's technology, over half a year, one way to Mars. And uh, you can go and learn and train and learn so much on the moon is close by before you take the risk to go to Mars. So not going back to the, also the surface of the moon and learn a lot before going to Mars is just stupid. So actually, one, one word about that. So we are still pioneering. Uh, we went on the moon and now think that it's very difficult to reach Mars, but we'll reach Mars. And the moon will be an easier step. Think what will be when we think to, to reach Pluto. And uh, Mars will look like uh, simple things. Simple, of course, not so simple, but an easier thing. Uh, now, at least at the European level, it's uh, raised a new concept of the moon village. Moon village, it means that the people, the agencies, different uh, institutions, private, public, will reach again the moon. But let's work together. Let's work as a unique concept. Everybody will bring on the moon something, telecommunications, mining, exploring, science, and so on. But let's do it in a concerted way. Let's do cooperating and bringing anytime something that could be used by others as well, like in a village. Uh, this is the concept of the moon village. It's just spread. Uh, it was presented at this Congress. And of course, in the next year, we uh, will develop. One other aspect that may be obvious to everybody is when we settled, when humanity settled or explored the United States and, and Australia, there were already people living there. There were already resources that could be taken advantage of. And even if the supply ship didn't come for a year, it didn't matter. You could still find food, you could build shelter, you could keep warm. Um, the moon has none of that, first of all, and so the logistics tale is incredibly critical. We don't know for sure whether we can modify Mars or operate on Mars in a way that is somewhat self-sustaining, but it'll, it'll be a long time before it's completely self-sustaining. So colonizing the moon or Mars or any other planet in the solar system is way, way out there. It's always going to have to have support from Earth. It's like living under the sea. You bring everything with you when you're in, a, in a, an experiment under, underwater. Humans can't go anywhere without an oxygen supply. And both of those planets will require that we carry our oxygen around all the time. It's really hard, and I hate to throw cold water on it because we'd all like to do it next year, but it's really hard. But we've got to keep working at it or we'll never get there. One day. I'd like to take a question if we can get down to the back of this side. Maybe that person in black with their black with red stripe. You, yes, you. If we can get the microphone down to... <laughs> That's a good example of, of you, Can I just ask my question very to, quickly in the meantime, before I hand it over? Is super right? quickly. Very quickly. This is in regards to human spaceflight. I think you guys are the most qualified to respond to this, which is in terms of 
going to Mars, there are so many issues. We've got cost issues, we've got psychological issues over such a long distance. Um, what do you guys think are going to be the biggest issues for us? Like we've seen all these amazing new concepts going out there, but as people have be spent so much time in space, do you think it's going to be working together for three years in a little spaceship, or is it going to be the technological stuff or funding this, or just the amount of time it's going to take to develop the whole thing? What would you say? Well, funding is the biggest issue. So I mean, if you go, got it? the same kind of resources as uh, the U.S. got during, or NASA got during the Apollo days, you could probably be on Mars in 10 years. Uh, yeah. The world community would give that kind of support. Uh, so make the economic, political decision, and then let's the engineers solve the problems. We'll solve them. But actually, I think for, for Mars flight, uh, radiation issue, what was said before, is going to be the biggest issue. But again, everything technical, technological, and even radiation is also an issue of uh, resourcing. How much uh, uh, available resources, hum uh, manpower, uh, money uh, is going to be involved in it. So everything is interconnected. Also, I think it's a matter of will. Because what, what we have in all of our governments around the world, and this, we've experienced this during the space station program, is the, the, the political systems of all of our nations sometimes have short-term memories. And trying to get them committed to providing the resources for a 10 or a 20 or a 30 year project is really challenging. And we all work very hard inside our own countries trying to remind our, our domestic leaders how important space is and trying to, to get that sense of purpose because the return on investment in doing things in space is very long term and sometimes it's hard to convince people who are serving for short periods of time that they should be investing that will. So with the will comes the resources and with the resources comes the ability to solve the technical problems. During Apollo, the U.S. share of the NASA share of the budget of the United States was eight times what it is now from a percentage standpoint. So funding is incredibly important. Connected to that is the amount of mass, sheer mass that you have to launch off the surface of the earth in order to take a long journey like that. And that all costs money. It requires very robust and powerful launch systems. Until we come up with somebody, somebody solving propulsion off the surface of the earth differently than we do it now chemically will make a big difference. So you kids out there get working on that. Um, but uh, I agree, we have to have <coughs> the motivation to do that. And I'll guarantee you that if, if we discovered that there was some mineral on the surface of Mars that provided uh, uh, eternal youth, <laughs> we would spend whatever it took to do that. <laughs> Hi. If you were 20 years old right now, what would you be doing to be an astronaut of the future? Have a good education course. If you were 20 years old right now, what would you be doing to become an astronaut of the future? The good education, I guess, is. I think we all agree. I would be thinking of uh, Uber, Airbnb, or something like that to make a ton of money so I could buy a ticket. <laughs> Actually, I think about being 20 quite often, but um, <laughs> 30, 30 was, a, yeah, was a better age, but, um, and I get asked this question quite often, and what I tell young people is, find what your passion is, uh, do what you love doing, if it's in a technical field, or engineering, medicine, uh, geology, whatever, so much the better, but just be really good at it, and if you do something you love, you're more likely to be really good at it. Um, and if you're given job assignments that aren't exactly what you had planned on, do e work even harder. Do the absolute best you can on those because you're proving to yourself that you can succeed no matter what. But just stay on that path because the likelihood, we, we're all very fortunate here, the likelihood of being able to be an astronaut for us was very low. We were all in the right place at the right time. So many of you won't be able to actually go into space, but you should be doing something a little joint for the rest of your life. And if one of those side trips takes you into space, so much the better. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree, and I was being a little bit tongue-in-cheek before, but I do think that um, 20 years from now, 
government astronaut programs will not be the only ones available out there. So what's really important is to succeed at whatever you choose. And the best way to succeed is, as Frank said, to pick something that you're really passionate about. Because you'll be good at it, you'll succeed, and that'll give you the best chance, whether within the government or in the private sector. Well, I'm actually going to ask the next question, <laughs> since I feel I have certain rights in my <laughs> We have something very special in our panel this afternoon. We have people who have flown on three different space stations, and I don't think you, you get them all in the same place very often. So, uh, starting at six, NIA, and the International Space Station. So, I'd be really interested in what uh, the members of our panel think of uh, the main differences and similarities between those, those very different environments uh, that, that were sort of all rolled up into the International Space Station at the end of the day. Maybe I have to start because I've flown something six. Salut 6, as you know, is only one module space station with two docking uh, points. So on one side was docked uh, the Salut, uh, Soyuz T4, the spacecraft of the main crew, they were Kovalyonok and Savinuk, and on the other side, uh, the visiting uh, space, uh, uh, spacecrafts uh, were docked. So our Soyuz 40. I flew on the last Soyuz of the first generation, Soyuz 40. We had uh, automatic programs on board, not computers, don't think about computers, don't think about <laughs> the high electronics we have now, but they did their job. They were built in such a way to accomplish all their duties. So the automatic programs, you just push the button and listen, click, 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 book, click, 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 book. Um, it was, uh, Turning on, turning off, uh, and we could adapt a little bit of time, making, it, uh, making the programs to work faster or slower. That was the only thing we could do from the automatic point of view. What means Salyut 6? Well, Salyut 6 was at that time the most complex space station. So actually the Russians uh, had the experience from Salyut 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and the first international crew flew on Salyut 6. Actually, in 1979, Vladimir Remek from the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia in that time, was the first non-Russian, non-American who flew on board the space station. So I was the 103rd person in the world flying on board this space station. So the module for me, flying for about 28 hours uh, on board Soyuz 40, a very small spaceship, uh, in the command module, the space in front of us was like the space in the front of any car you drive now, a small car. Uh, floating inside the space station, it looked for me amazing big, the space. But there were about 80 uh, cubic meters uh, of air inside. Uh, watching now the movies from the International Space Station, you can hide there, you can lose yourself in there. There are many, many modules. It's completely different that we have. But always, with all these differences, we had all necessary things to live and work properly on board Salyut 6. Yeah, maybe I will add a little bit that actually all these Salyut stations were different stations uh, with uh, different capabilities. First one was uh, had only one docking system and was not able to um, uh, refuel. Then we had uh, extra docking ports, we had capability to refuel, and different stations were really different. Uh, Mir station from Salute stations uh, is different uh, because it, it was multi-modular, and um, it's actually allowed us uh, at a certain point. Uh, it also was international because people were flying uh, people from different countries uh, had experience to fly in space, but the uh, majority of pieces was built in one place. And that showed the uh, current uh, level of technology, because uh, when we transitioned from Mir Station to International Space Station, that was the next step, because even some pieces were built in different places. And usually uh, for the uh, space facility, we try to make uh, tests on the ground to be sure that uh, pieces are fit to each other, all connections are made properly, there is no uh, 
electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic interference and things like that. But on the International Space Station, some pieces never uh, met each other until we took them in space. So it's really different <coughs> levels of technology, uh, different capabilities. Uh, uh, now on station we have even two different um, power system because on American segment is one, one uh, voltage on Russian is another and we learn how to, to make it compatible. So everything was not easy and sometimes it seems like people were floating in space on uh, salutes, people were floating in space on Mir and on ISS, but really the uh, way we did things uh, were different and we really evolving uh, in uh, being capable to, to build new and more uh, complex uh, space structures. I fear to say we're just about out of time and I know that you all had so many questions that unfortunately you won't have time to get to today. So the only thing for it is to keep coming to International Astronautical Congress and the future astronaut panels. So thank you all for coming today for your very insightful and interesting questions and please join me in thanking our wonderful panel.